Anyway, who here has used Shorewall? Anybody? A couple people? Okay. Um, just kind of want to know what I'm dealing with here. This is probably my least prepared presentation, so I'll go really slow. All right. Um, so what is Shorewall? Well, it's kind of a management interface that gives you some utilities for managing various networking features in the Linux kernel. Uh, most predominantly, it gives you a way of managing uh, NetFilter and ID tables. Uh, has some support for uh, handling the way the kernel routes traffic. Um, it has some nice wrappers around uh, the way that you deal with VPN connections and bonding, uh, traffic control, things like that. I'm not going to go too much into some of those advanced features because uh, um, we could be here all day. But uh, I want to give you guys kind of a, a brief introduction to Shorewall uh, and uh, as an alternative to some other firewalling packages that are out there. Um, I forgot to throw in the de facto who am I slide. I'm Doran Barton. Uh, I am a senior developer at Bluehost. Um, we have quite a presence at the conference. So uh, go Bluehost. Um, so why not just use NetFilter? Why not just use IP tables? And uh, I have, you know, an argument for that. There is an argument for that. But um, if you are a network administrator, the way that you think of the, the types of things that you're doing as part of your job is not in terms of what table does this packet need to you know, be forwarded from. You know, the, the, the way that IP tables handles its traffic is not conducive to the way that we think as a network administrator when we're setting policy decisions. We, policy decision says traffic from the outside world coming in on port 22, which is SSH, um, should be allowed to go through to this internal IP address. Um, the IP tables configuration file, or if you've, if you've uh, seen IP table scripts, uh, they don't operate in that, in that, uh, that way of thinking. So here's uh, IP tables, one of many charts that try to explain the way that IP tables processes things. And uh, there's, it's, it's not a simple in and out type thing. But there is in and there is out, but this is in from any, any interface on your system. So if you have like three or four different Ethernet cards in there, this is inbound traffic going into your system, and it goes through a pre-routing table, and some decisions are made there, and, and then there might be some rules in the, in the NAT table, and, uh, and, and you know, if, if, the, if the packet is destined for the firewall itself, it comes down here and might get filtered, and then it might be visited. Say you've got Apache running on the server that's the firewall. Here's Apache. It does its thing, sends, sends data out, and then you know it kind of goes through this whole thing. And you can see if you have routing decisions that are being made, they're done up here. Um, if you have some forwarding decisions that are made, you know, they're, they're going to some other machine on the network somewhere, or you're doing port forwarding, that sort of thing. Uh, so this is just, just this flow doesn't really match what we're thinking when we're looking at uh, our policy handbook that says we don't want SMTP traffic going through the firewall without going through our mail server, you know, that, that sort of thing. The types of things that that we want to uh, uh, implement as policy. So um, as an example, here's just a, an excerpt of an IP tables script that I just pulled off of some website that says, you know, here's, uh, we want to allow certain ICMP types. So we, we uh, add some, some rules to the input table that says if we get stuff from 
uh, input from ETH0 of type ICMP. If it's an echo request or an echo reply, we accept it. These, these are the types of things that are going on in IP tables. But uh, it's uh, maybe a little too detailed, and it does differ from, like I said, if you're, if you're a network administrator thinking in terms of policy. This stuff is not, um, it, it, you can get buried in the details. So here's Shorewall, a diagram that explains how Shorewall works. Shorewall divides everything up into zones. So the machine that's actually doing the firewalling is the firewall, the firewall zone. That's this gray rectangle over here. And uh, this is an example where we have a firewall that is connected to the internet. That's the red zone up there. We call that the net. And, uh, and then you have a local network. We'll call that the loc zone. And, uh, and then let's say we have some servers that uh, are connected to the firewall. Uh, they need some internet connectivity. Uh, we want to maybe give them uh, a filter DNS. These, these are uh, servers that we want to put in our demilitarized zone so that we put them in the DMZ over here. Um, and we want to carefully uh, manage what access. Uh, we want to be separate from the local zone for security reasons. Um, but maybe we want the uh, uh, local people to be able to access these just like somebody from the internet would. Or maybe we want uh, the local people to have SSH access to these machines. Uh, obviously the net, we don't want them to have SSH access. Um, we have people that are maybe connecting with OpenVPN. And so we put those connections into a zone that we call the VPN zone. Um, and uh, I guess you know, they have a Wi-Fi a wi zone for people that are connected to the local wireless network. That could be really handy if, um, if you want to allow guest access. You know, you want an open wireless access point on your network, but you, you, you want to apply some policy to that traffic. Uh, so this is, in a diagram, you know, the way that Shorewall sees things. And then on the firewall, you can implement policy. You can implement rules that say what traffic can and can't pass between the zones. And if you try to do this kind of stuff in IP tables, you know that's not fun. It's not fun at all. And the short wall, it's pretty straightforward. When we first build a zone, we can add more zones. Up yeah, you can. You, you there, there. Uh, the zones that are typically, you know, there's a typical configuration, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but, but uh, Shorewall comes out of the box with some sample configs that have a, a one interface config, a two interface config, three interface config, um, and then you can kind of, I, I, what I like to do is, is take that and customize one of those to, uh, to whatever it is I'm doing. Okay, so installing Shorewall. Um, I use Fedora and CentOS, so I just do a yum install. Um, I think it's in the I think it's in the in the core repository for uh, for CentOS, but if it's not, it's in Apple, which is the the Red Hat blessed extras repository for CentOS and Red Hat Enterprise. Um, it's available on Ubuntu, which is a very popular distribution that I've never used because. I'm a Red Hat guy. Um, and I found out that it's even available for those weirdos that use Gentoo. Um, and for everybody else, you can go to this URL, and there's all kinds of options, um, downloading tarballs and other things. So configuring Shorewall. Now that you've got it installed, you want to set it up. Um, all the uh, configuration files go in Etsy Shorewall. Um, I mentioned before that there's some sample configs. Uh, on Enterprise Linux, you can go into user share, doc, packages, and then Shorewall, whatever version gets installed, and then there's a directory called samples. And then inside that samples directory, there's a couple of other subdirectories, one interface, two interface, three interface. 
So one interface, duh. That's a machine with one connection. So if that's, that could be, you know, your one machine that's connected to the internet. Um, if you have two interfaces, then you're looking at, you know, you, you have one machine that's connected to the internet and you have a local network that's connected to that machine. And three interfaces, their example for three interfaces, you have uh, a net zone, a local zone, and then, and then a DMZ. But it could be, you could take that DMZ example and apply it to your public Wi-Fi or your VPN and that sort of thing, and then start from there. You can add more interfaces and go. Okay. Um, to enable Shorewall, there's two things, really. You need to use check config to turn on the init process so that it is started at boot. Um, and then the other thing is in the main Shorewall comp, which you really never need to edit except to turn it on. And that you're going to find a, a line that says startup enabled equals no. And that's the default setting out of the box. So you obviously want to change that. Otherwise, when you start it, it won't actually start. Any questions? OK. And then any time you make a change to a configuration, uh, you, do a, you, you can actually run the init script. Some, some administrators prefer running slash etsy slash initd, whatever. Uh, Red Hat servers give you this sbin service script that makes it a lot easier to just type service something, restart, or reload, or start, stop, whatever. So anytime you make a change, just do a reload, send reload to the init script, and that's what the service uh, script does for you. Okay, so again, zones. Uh, typical zone naming. Now these, uh, Rob asked, you know, are, they, are these kind of set in stone? No, these are just typical names, and they're uh, the ones that are used in the examples, but you can name them anything you want. Uh, net. The internet. Um, FW is the firewall itself. Uh, you'll find a lot of times, and I'm not, I'm not really certain why this is, but uh, they, they refer to it in the configs as dollar sign at capital FW. Uh, I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but um, it's the firewall. And then uh, LOC is the local network. And DMZ, uh, if you have a VPN, you can call it VPN for that zone, um, or Wi-Fi, whatever. So the zones are pretty arbitrary, but these are the, the typical ones that are used uh, by people that implement Shorewall. Configuring zones. This is uh, setting up your zones for the first time. So here's, this is, you'll, you'll see a couple of things here. First of all, um, the configuration files that are in the, in the sample set are pretty well documented. They give you uh, some hints as to what fields you need or you could have. Are you just stretching? Or are you raising your hand thinking about it? OK. Uh, and I've noticed that some of the more recent uh, configuration sample sets actually have copies of these files. That, so if you have, like, this is uh, uh, the zones file. You will find in the uh, in the sample set there'll be a zones dot annotated file, and that is just comprehensively uh, commented to the nth degree of what you could possibly put in here and why and how and and you know ninety percent of that stuff you'll never use. Um, so anyway, this is this is pretty much a copy of the three interface zones file. And you'll see in here, uh, most, of the, most of the interfaces that we're going to use, most of the zones are declared as IPv4. Uh, Shorewall does have support for IPv6, but don't ask me. I've never done it. Um, but there's some great documentation out there uh, that will probably give you uh, what you need to get started. FW is a zone that represents a firewall. That's pretty straightforward. So those are just uh, white space. White space separated lines of text. There's the, the syntax is really pretty loose. Um, this this file, uh, 
that we've got here doesn't have any options uh, or anything for the in and out. Um, to be honest with you, I've never done anything that fancy that I needed those. But, um, but if you read that zones.annotated file, you'll see all the different possibilities. <laughs> okay, so now that you have these zones defined, you want to match up the zones with the physical interfaces on, on the firewall. So this is where you actually specify the interface uh, name. So in this case, you know, we've got ETH0 uh, assigned to the net zone. So this is the one you plug into your DSL router. And, uh, and then ETH1 uh, is the one you plug into your switch that goes to your local area network. And then if you've got, in this, in this example, they've got the, the DMZ for those servers that we want kind of isolated. Uh, so we have another switch for them. Plug those into ETH2. Now, if you've used Fedora or some of these uh, more recent, more bleeding edge Linux distributions, uh, you'll notice that the interface names are no longer standard ETH number. Uh, there's They've kind of taken on a life of their own. Um, and some the Shorewall documentation, there, this has changed a little bit. Um, but to be honest with you, I, I haven't really implemented Shorewall on one of those yet. Uh, but if, I'm just giving you a heads up that if you do try to implement it on a, on a system that implements those, uh, um, those new fancy uh, interface names, to be prepared for that. Because that way, you can define uh, the interface here in a way that you will get assigned to the right interface name no matter what it whatever the kernel assigns to that you can I, I think the interfaces can have like UUIDs that sort of thing yeah you got a question yeah, you know, I've seen it before I don't know what it means no smurfs no smurfs don't want we don't like smurfs in the open source community yeah. we've always had a problem with smurfs oh. Rob do you know about smurfs okay these, these are, uh, this, this is some really simple uh, filtering options on the, on the, on the wire. You know, what, what do we want kind of out of the box uh, to be going on here? Um, and Smurfs are a kind of packet that comes across the network. And here we're saying we don't want them. I wish I could answer that better. <laughs> I've seen Colonel kernel warnings that say, you know, that we've had a smurf attack, you know, or, or, you know, that a smurf was detected, that sort of thing. Sounds like something Bluehost ought to be yeah. familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not, not qualified to answer the question. Does anybody in here know what a smurf is? It's a distributed kernel service attack. Um, it's a specific type of attack that gets crafted. Okay. My, I've, I've seen warnings yeah. in my log where I'm fairly sure I wasn't being attacked. So maybe it was mistaken identity type thing? It's possible. Okay. Um, you know, normally with those kind of things, it's, it's just a hack that they craft that says, um, a lot of times it's either a sin hack or something like that, or it's a sin that goes, it opens up a, a port, and that's a sin attack that I can play with. You know, okay. Smurf is very similar. If, you think, if you've seen them and you don't think you were being attacked? Well, like if I'm on a, um, if I'm on a closed network, I don't have a... Really? You were seeing them on a phone? That's, that's interesting. Okay. What, it, what it, that would suggest to me is that, that there is somebody in your LAN segment that is being targeted. Okay. And it's often that people that are smurfing that are really... The, the vast majority of smurf network activity is, is a sniffing activity. Oh, okay. they're trying to do certain things to find So out one of my kids is doing a, a TCP dump or a NMAP type thing. Well, that's a possibility. Okay. All right, so that it's it's evidence of malice or, or yes. malicious behavior going or, on on, on, or on that. Or a precursor to real malice. <laughs> okay. Um, now, along that same line, maybe you guys can tell us about Martians. Is it kind of the same? Martians are where a router has disagreeing information about MAC addresses. Oh, okay. And. Some, lots of times those tables get messed up legitimately and it's simply that it's getting reported that 
a host that, that thinks it's one MAC address is not. It's so it's like maybe an ARP cache issue? That's very, very similar okay. situation. Okay. All right. All right. So um, these are the, the, you know, these are the options that just come with the sample configurations, and uh, they work good for me. Uh, Martians are uh, one of those dozen networks for whatever reason the discussion about the camera. So much. The 192, that one's just good. That kind of stuff on the internet side will, it's obviously true, so whatever. It's not real. If you don't route, you're not supposed to route that. You just drop it. Okay. Uh, why you didn't? In our company, the current network, I saw the Martin logs. Or you have someone who's plugged in a printer that has a default 192 address. Yeah. yeah. Is advertising that on a route 176. Okay. Um, so the next thing you do after you define your interface and your zones, you could start defining some rules. And the rules go in your Etsy Shorewall rules file. And uh, the, the syntax of this file at its simplest level is simply a macro. And the macro can be as simple as accept or drop or deny. And then you have a source zone and a destination zone. And then it just gets more complex from there. So let's uh, look at some examples. Now, you notice uh, I, I said that the, the, the macro can be something as simple as accept. Uh, our first one up there is an accept rule. And it says that uh, packets originating from the firewall that are destined for any address on the net, in the net zone, of type ICMP, those are allowed. They're accepted. The firewall lets them through. Um, Shorewall comes with a directory, I think it's called user share Shorewall, um, that just contains macros. And the macros are typically for uh, defining services. So we have a macro in that, in that directory called ping, ping.macro or macro.ping, I can't remember which one it is. Um, and so uh, that it's a, this gives you a shortcut so that you can say ping and then the action you want for that service, drop anything from the net to the firewall. So that says we don't want anybody out on the public internet to be able to ping us. Uh, but we do want people on the local network to ping the firewall because otherwise, you know, how would you know if, if we're up? Uh, you want the DMZ to be able to ping the firewall could be useful. Um, I can see cases where you would not want the DMZ to even know that the firewall existed, but that's a topic for another discussion. Uh, ping, we want the local network to be able to ping hosts within the DMZ. Um, somebody called, said this FTP server was down. Well, can you ping it? Well, let me try. Uh, we want to be able to ping from the DMZ to the local network. Well, that seems questionable, but that's what it says. Uh, and we want to be able to ping from the DMZ to the public internet. Pretty simple. Okay. So the default to not allow anything, and here we're saying these are the things we're going to. Right, right. The default is, is fairly restrictive. And so anything that you add in the, in the, in the rules file is above and beyond that very restrictive state. Okay, so let's, uh, the way that you add rules for specific IPs within a zone is you have the zone name, colon, and then the IP for a specific host. So in this case, um, this is, I think, Xmission's web server. <laughs> so I want somebody logged into Xmission's web server uh, to be able to SSH to my firewall. Um, and I want, you know, and then th these are pretty typical of what we've seen before. So people on the local network can SSH to the firewall. Uh, people on the local, local network can SSH to hosts on the public internet. Any questions? SSH contains port information or 
Yeah, so the, in that macro file, it's, it, let's, let's take a look at one. Let's uh, come over and I think I've got the shore wall stuff installed on here. Let's blow that up. So. Oh, okay, we'll get it installed then. Okay, so now we can go into user share shore wall and look at this. What, what do they look like? Okay, it's macro dot SSH. Uh, yeah, this file says that SSH is any traffic protocol TCP port twenty two. Pretty simple. Okay. So if you want to do some stuff with port numbers, let's say you're running a Quake server on your firewall. Um, because who doesn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. I, I, think, it's, I think that just sounds right. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can. <laughs> yeah. I know, um, I know that you can comma separate, like if you have like four IPs that you want to have SSH access to this, you know, they, you can put those, you know, uh, zone, colon, IP address, comma, IP address, comma, and so forth. But it seems like you could, you know, like if you wanted like a slash 32, you know, or something like that, you could do that. But. Yeah, you can just do the dash. Or commas. Yeah. Okay. So, again, you know, if, you're, if you uh, are running a quick server on your firewall and you want others to be able to connect to it, I can't see this happening in the corporate, uh, you know, corporate scenario, but, you know. You never have been a Boy Scout leader. <laughs> but at home, you know, your server that you're running at home. Uh, we were having a conversation just a couple hours during uh, the lunch break, or maybe it was this morning. Uh, Jared Smith uh, has this little box. It looks like a switch, like a little five-port switch or something. And he says, this is a server. The Marvell, yeah. And he says, yeah, it's got like a dual core something in it, and it's got two gigabit ports and two USB 3.0 ports and stuff. And, and, the, and the first thing I thought was, we should put Shorewall on it. <laughs> but he says Shorewall doesn't play well with VoIP, which is what he's mostly concerned about because he's an asterisk geek. But uh, so he was talking about Monowall, which is similar to Shorewall in, the, in, in one sense. But I guess it's PHP-based. It gives you a web-based. But it's BSD under the wraps, isn't it? Does anybody know anything about Monowall? OK. I, I, I played with it years ago back. I remember we had to, we saved the configuration on a floppy drive. And so the machine would boot off the floppy into Monowall. And the configuration was on the floppy drive. And of course, about once every three months, the something would happen to the floppy and it wouldn't work anymore because it was a floppy drive, you know. But anyway, that was Monowall. So for your Quake server, how, what about the outbound traffic? Are going, is this one way? So this 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 allows traffic from the net to the firewall. Yeah, I mean, there's there's going to be some some connection tracking going on here. It does it all for you. It also depends on your policies as well. If you remember, I think in our example we said all outbound traffic from the firewall was accepted. Or 
Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's ringing a really loud bell for me. So um, it depends on the policy. So if you've denied all outbound traffic from the firewall, you'd have to add an exception on this as well, I think. Well, right. Yes. Correct. But when you, when, you, when you think about under the wraps, that first diagram that I showed you of the IP tables flow, it's still going on. Shorewall is just configuring all that for you. So if you have Quake server in that local process and it's sending stuff back out, the firewall, you know, the kernel knows that this is a response to that. At least for TCP. I'm not sure about yeah, UDP. Okay. I don't think so. I defer my, to his why wisdom. Boink doesn't work as well with Shorewall. That's really that's what Jared was saying to me, and he says it's not so much Shorewall as it is NetFilter, and maybe the defaults that Shorewall implements using NetFilter. And I said so it could be improved, so that it could be more Boink friendly. And he, yeah, yeah, you could do that. So uh, just just be aware that. Uh, if you're if you're trying to do SIP stuff through uh, a firewall that you're building on top of Linux, there are some caveats. <laughs> okay, so one thing that most people want to do when they're when they're doing a, a firewall, especially if it's like at home and you have a firewall with one external address, but you have machines behind the firewall that need to be able to do things, uh, port forwarding. So. Uh, Shorewall calls this DNAT, Dynamic Network Address Translation. And uh, so that's the action that you have down here in place of like accept or deny or drop. So in here we have the, the macro defined by VNC, which says it's probably a port range, 5900 through 59 something. Uh, this basically says that anybody on the net that connects via VNC should uh, have their traffic forwarded to this, this host on our local network. Um, in this case, this first example, we're not doing anything funky with the ports. We're not saying if they're connecting on this port, forward it to this port. We're, so if this person connects on 5901, it's going to connect to this machine on 5901. It's just forwarding the traffic to that host. This next rule says, um, I think I got this backwards. <laughs> that we have traffic coming into the firewall. Uh, the idea here is that we were trying to do uh, traffic coming in on port 80, and we wanted to go to um, this host on port 5000. But I think I got this backwards. So um, over here, I think we're putting the, uh, the, the original port number. And then here is the host port number that's going to get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this should be TCP 80 to say this is the, uh, um, uh, the protocol and port that the traffic's coming in on, and then this is the destination that it's, that it's going to. And that's not a macro? It's saying DNA or DNA? Yeah, DNA, this, there's, there's not a macro in here. That's why we're telling you about the protocol and port over here. Okay. IP masquerading. This is the idea that you know, that we don't need IPv6. We've got IPv4 with masquerading. We can put thousands of machines behind one IP address. Uh, the Shorewall docs explains that in their terminology, masquerading is when your firewall gets a dynamic IP. So you never know what IP your firewall is going to have on the outside world. Uh, but if you do, Shorewall calls that source netting. But either way, you define in this Etsy Shorewall mask file your external interface and the um, subnets. You define the subnets here that are going to be masqueraded behind it. Does that make sense? So this external interface is going to get an IP address. This will be your external interface. And then you're saying these are the subnets that are going to be masqueraded behind it. Yes? And is that comma separated as well? 
Yes. So if you have multiple subnets, yeah. OK. Another quick example that I wanted to run through is doing OpenVPN. And actually, I didn't have any OpenVPN configuration stuff here. I'm leaving that as an exercise for you <laughs> as far as like setting up your OpenVPN and generating your keys and setting up your client. But let's assume that you have an OpenVPN server running on your firewall and you want to set up shore wall so that an, uh, some road warrior type VPN user can connect to your network. So the first thing you need, and we've mentioned this before, is you need a zone. So you add that VPN zone to your zones file. Um, that's right up there. And it's, it's just the standard IPv4 zone. And then you add an entry to the interfaces file. Um, you'll notice here that this looks a little different. <coughs> Excuse me. Instead of having a, a, an explicit interface name like ETH0 or ETH5, we have ton plus. Because if you have multiple people connecting to your OpenVPN server, um, you're going to have multiple ton connections. You're going to have ton 0, ton 1, ton 2, and so forth for however many people are connecting to your uh, um, to your VPN server. So uh, that takes care of all of them. And then uh, this, now one, one thing to take into consideration here is uh, I had a situation a few years ago where I had a road warrior contingent where, you know, you had people out there that were connecting from, you know, wherever. They could be a coffee shop or they could be home or whatever. They're connecting in from any place on the, on the net. Um, but then I also had, an, we had a, a development office and then we had a development environment at a data center and then we had a production environment at a data center and I had set up dedicated VPN connections between the firewall at the office and each of those environments. And so my shorewall configuration was a little different there because uh, I had specific IPs that were connecting to each of those devices and, in fact, different zones for each of those different networks that were connected there. So that, that made things a little bit more interesting. And in those cases, uh, you could define the zones as specific, uh, specific ton devices. But anyway, so down here, this is something different, something new when you're dealing with uh, VPNs is you add something to this tunnels file. And that just basically says uh, we're running OpenVPN on this port um, and people are going to be connecting from this zone and I can't remember what this, what the, what the, uh, uh, it looks like anybody from any address can connect to it. Um, yeah, it kind of looks, it, this kind of looks like, you know, we're not putting any restrictions in place for, uh, for who can, who can use it. Uh, but I imagine, uh, if, if we wanted to, we could go in and say, you know, that, that uh, only people from this subnet can, can connect. Um, so let's add some rules here. Now that we have this VPN zone, we can say that, you know, SSH is accepted from the VPN to the local network or uh, SSH is accepted from uh, a host on the VPN network to the firewall, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, one thing that I haven't really talked about is the fact that Shorewall has some really great documentation. Uh, if you go to their website, shorewall.net, uh, shorewall uh, there you go to the documentation link. They will tell you everything you need to know and lots of stuff you didn't need to know uh, about how to do things like this. Uh, they actually walk you through three or four different common open VPN uh, scenarios as not just setting up the shore wall part but actually setting up the VPN client and server in addition to the shore wall configuration okay and that yeah I got ahead of myself there um, that's the examples that I want to go through in the presentation today um, just to give you guys a taste of what shore wall can do and how easy it is to configure um, if you uh, try to do these same sort of things 
in, you know, like Etsy sysconfig IP tables on a Red Hat box. Um, it's, it's a lot more convoluted and a lot more detailed than just saying, you know, I want... A lot more lines, too. Yeah, a lot more, a lot more lines. And, and there's a reason why, if you go out there and search for IP tables configuration, uh, so many people say, I'll just screw the Red Hat sysconfig file, write your own script, this shell script that, you know, that populates your IP tables for you. Um, because it's, it's not the most straightforward thing in the world. And, uh, and, and again, it comes back to when you're thinking in terms of policies, I want traffic from, this, you know, from, from these hosts on this network to be able to get to these hosts on this network. Um, Shorewall makes it very straightforward. Uh, and again, uh, every single file in Etsy Shorewall, for example, the zones file, if you want to get documentation for that, you type man shorewall dash zones and exhaustive documentation on the zones file will magically appear inside your terminal window. Um, so there's excellent man pages for every single file that's, that's in that directory. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, if you, in your, uh, the shorewall distribution will come with a docs samples directory and inside that are at least, um, one, two, and three interface example subdirectories with all the files. You can just pick up those files and copy them into Etsy Shorewall and then go tweak them the way that you want and then start Shorewall and you're, you're off to the races. Any questions? Ross thinking? Uh-huh. Let's, let's take a look at something. Um, I would think because, because the way that, uh, that Shorewall uh, addresses a lot of the other issues. So, as you can see here, there's lots of really good information. It is EDP, which means great stuff. By the way, so in my short wall config, uh, the only, so I've got an atypical configuration as well. So I actually have. Use it to NAT out or NAT thing out? Yes. So I have an external interface that I actually have two IPs on. So I have a virtual IP on it. And the only time that I even specify an IP address in any of my configurations is specifying which IP address I want traffic to go out of. Because I want my DMZ traffic to go out of a different IP than my regular well, yes, traffic. Well, you have static IP then, that's great. But yes, but in a normal masquerading thing where you don't want to you know, differentiate between different sources, you don't have to specify anything. So. You won't have to change it every time. Incoming port stuff too, like port 80. Uh, yeah, I don't have port 80 listening on my actual firewall, so just forward that to some other uh, internal. And that's hard coded over time. And whatever uh, from Marsha, or one IP, what's this doing? Yeah. So but this I is. I have troubles trying to masquerade out and then come in on 80 at all the time with pre routing rules and doing that to work with that. You know. uh, after four months, I found it out. I think that's pretty simple in Shorewall. Is, you know, if you have, if you, if you want to, if you want to say, I, you know, local traffic hitting the firewall on port 80, gets bounced or redirected back into a machine on the local network. Um, I know I've done some stuff like that with transparent proxying. That's one thing we do at home. I use Dan's yeah, Guardian. I do the same thing too. Yeah. And it was a piece of cake to set it up with Shorewall. Yeah, I think it's like three lines in Shorewall. It's like take all the stuff coming from local on port 80, 
redirected to port 80, 80. And does it work if you're also coming in on port 80 uh, to another one and out and quitting and short? So there's, I mean, there's some, there's definitely some stuff here on the SIP stuff. Uh, I think there's another. Yeah, that's that's when I give up and I say yeah. Yeah, I think there's an open stack uh, presentation right now, just down the hall. It was actually last session. I think. Oh, okay. I came from that one. Oh, okay. Good. Was it good? Yeah. Okay. Did we get it on video? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. All right. So anyway, um, I'll just end with that. Thank you.